everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly and in today's video we're going to be talking about a jane doe case this jane doe case is known by two names so it's known as the nude in the nettles jane doe and also the sutton bank jane doe um so you may have heard it being referred to as either one um but yeah i don't think i've ever covered a jane doe case on my channel before i've done a john doe case um i think like a few months ago now but i've never done a jane doe one so i'm finally here doing one today i just wanted to clear something up before I actually get into this case. Um, I've had a few comments in some of my recent videos saying that they can hear like sometimes some like heavy breathing in the background of my videos and I just wanted to clear up what that is because a lot of people thought it was just me like heavy breathing which it wasn't. Um, it's actually some cars outside. I live like right next to quite a busy main road um, and I film in my garage so I'm like right next to the road. I try and speak when the cars aren't going past but obviously it's a main road so it's a little bit unavoidable at times you can probably hear it in the background now and I do try and like edit the sound out as much as possible but I'm not that good with like technology so I don't really know what I'm doing so yeah I just wanted to um clear that up at the start of this video so that you kind of know what that sound is um but yeah, I just want to clarify that my intent with these videos is never to offend or upset anyone that may have been involved with the case. All of the information I found on this video has been from several different sources online, so I do apologise if anything is incorrect, or if you think that I've missed something out that is really important to the video, as always, please feel free to let me know in the comments. And having said all of that, let's just get into today's case. So at around 8am on Friday the 28th of August 1981, Ripon Police Station in North Yorkshire received a pretty mysterious phone call. The phone call was answered by PC John Jeffries who spoke to, in his own words, a well-spoken man. This man on the other end of the line told John the following, near Scorton Moor House you will find a decomposing body among the willow herbs. So PC Jeffries obviously thought this was rather odd and so he asked this man on the other end of the line, this well-spoken man, for his name and his details. However, this man refused to give over his identity for national security reasons and once he said that this man just hung up the phone and to this day police have never been able to trace him he's never been identified no one knows who this well-spoken man on the other end of the line was so after this phone call pc john jeffries went to another police officer and he told him about the really weird conversation he just had with this stranger on the phone who told him about a decomposing body in the area and so this other police officer who knew the area quite well decided to go and have a look. This police officer arrived at the area, arrived at Scorton Moor House and he began just looking around. However, initially he couldn't actually find anything. And so at this point, the police officer began thinking that maybe the caller was lying, maybe he was joking, maybe he was pulling some kind of sick prank. However, as he carried on his search, he actually unearthed what he thought looked like a human skull near Sutton Bank. So this police officer thinking that he may have just found part of a human skull, notified the local local criminal investigations department and they sent out a team of detectives to kind of look through the area thoroughly. And the team was headed by Detective Chief Superintendent Strickland Carter. After a quick search of the area, it didn't appear as though there was any other kind of evidence or human remains at the scene. But some of this area by Sutton Bank was very overgrown. There were a lot of nettles, bushes, plants and stuff like that. So police began cutting all of those down and that's when they found the deep decomposing body of a woman who was led between two conifer plants. Now this woman's body was found completely naked and near the body police actually discovered three fresh track marks indicating that someone had been near the body before it was obviously discovered by police. And so at this point, police began suspecting that anonymous caller who made the call to police telling them that there was a decomposing body in the area. Because if this anonymous caller had just stumbled across this body by accident, why not tell police your name? Why refuse to give them your identity? Unless you had something to do with this woman's death. So once the team of detectives had found this body, they sent in a forensic pathologist to examine the body at the scene. And by 4.30pm that day, all the fingertip searching and photographs of the crime scene had been taken, and all potential evidence at the scene was taken to be examined further, including a piece of evidence that was found underneath this woman's body. 
body. So underneath this woman's body, detectives found either one of two things. Some sources say that they found um, like a lid from a tin of meat paste and some sources say it was a yogurt pot lid. Um, so I'm not really sure which one it was. Most sources said the yogurt pot one, so I'm inclined to believe that it was a yogurt pot lid, but um, I'm not entirely sure. I don't suppose it matters too much to the actual case, but I just thought I'd let you know that some sources say a yogurt pot lid and some sources say a lid from a tin of meat paste. But whichever it was, this lid actually gave police a vital clue in the case. On this lid, I believe, was the date when this product was sold and it dated back to October of 1979, indicating that this woman's body had been led here undiscovered for around two years because obviously she was found two years later in 1981. Now due to the fact that this woman was completely naked it meant that she obviously didn't have any clothing on or jewellery on, nothing that could identify her through that because obviously she was really badly decomposed it was going to be really hard to identify her through like dna or anything like that so if she was wearing some clothing or some jewelry they could try to identify her through that but obviously like i said she was completely naked and so this case was going to be really hard for police three months after this jane doe was discovered medical students and a television makeup department actually came together and created a wax work reconstruction of this woman's head, what they believe that this woman would have looked like or could have looked like when she was alive. Because like I've said, this woman was badly decomposed. She had been dead for at least two years. And so they came together and made this reconstruction. And I'll put that on the screen now so that you can see it. And they literally just shared this image in the press everywhere, hoping that someone would come forward and identify this woman. But unfortunately, it didn't really bring forward any leads in the case. No one ever came forward to identify identify her. Police continued investigating this case for about a year and a half, however after that time they had pretty much exhausted all leads in the case. They had nothing left to go on. Like I mentioned before, this case was going to be really hard for police to solve because obviously it was the 1980s. They didn't have the kind of forensic technology that we have nowadays. And they also weren't getting any tips or leads from the public regarding this Jane Doe. So you're probably wondering how this woman actually died. And the pathologist determined that this woman's cause of death was from an unexplained incident. So basically they have no idea how she actually died. However, given the fact that this woman was obviously found completely naked and her body had just been dumped in this area before it was eventually found, it obviously indicates that foul play was probably involved in her death. And like I said before, this well-spoken man who made the phone call to police about the body was the top suspect in the case, but no one knew who he was. Because of where this woman's body was found, police determined that it was pretty unlikely that someone would have just stumbled upon this body by accident because it was so well concealed by the nettles and the bushes and the plants and stuff like that. And it's the police's belief that the person who rang the police station that day telling them where this decomposing body was, was probably the person that killed her because if you're innocent, why not just tell police your name? Why did he refuse to give police his identity? Something positive that did come from the investigation into this case is that police were able to trace 164 missing women. So from an examination of this woman's body, here's what we do know about this Jane Doe and her kind of features. So police believe that she was around 35 to 40 years old when she died. She was approximately five foot two in height. She had a kind of slender build. Her hair was naturally dark brown and worn in a page boy style. She had a deviated septum between between her nostrils, possibly from birth or caused by trauma to the nose. So they don't know if that was just something that she was born with or that happened at some point in her life. There was also evidence that she had previously broken her ankle years before death. Um, she may have had two to three children and due to an abnormality in her neck vertebrae, she would have suffered from a bad back. All of her upper teeth were missing and she had an upper dental plate fitted. She had just six lower teeth remaining but they were very stained, suggesting that she was a smoker and a heavy drinker and police felt that she did not pay much attention to herself and her appearance when she was alive. That's not me saying that by the way, that's just what the police have said about her. However, in contrast, she was wearing pink nail varnish on her toenails from the Max Factor Maxi range and that, along with having her hair cut, suggests that she must have taken some pride in her appearance. And police believe she also wore a size 4 UK shoe. Sutton Bank Jane Doe was eventually 
buried in 1983, so two years after she was first found in Moulton Cemetery with only a handful of police officers at her burial. Her coffin was inscribed with the words, name unknown, died 28th of August 1981, the day that her body was found. At one point, police believed that this woman could have been an inmate at Ashcombe Grange Prison who escaped in 1979. This escaped inmate was named Geraldine Crawley and Geraldine actually sent police some fingerprints and her signature to prove to them that she was still alive and that she wasn't this Jane Doe. And I actually don't know if Geraldine was ever found and if she was taken back to prison after this but if she was then she essentially gave herself in so that she could be removed from police's inquiries. People also had their suspicions that this Jane Doe could have been a victim of the Yorkshire Rippers of Peter Sutcliffe's however this theory was pretty much ruled out due to the lack of pattern with all of his other victims and this case just literally went cold for years. Police had no new information, no tips, no leads, they had nothing to go on and then in 2011, so 30 years after Sutton Bank Jane Doe's body was discovered, North Yorkshire Police actually made a fresh appeal for new information regarding this case. And this appeal resulted in five separate families coming forward to police and asking them if this Jane Doe could have been one of their family members that they hadn't heard from or seen in years. And so because of this, because of these new potential leads in the case, detectives actually applied for permission to exhume this Jane Doe's body. So literally dig up her body. They wanted to do this, they wanted to dig up her remains after all these years so that they could hopefully try to gain some DNA samples from her body. Because obviously in 2011 they would have had a lot better kind of forensic technology than they did have 30 years earlier in 1981. They were eventually granted permission to do this and so they dug up her body and they managed to create a full DNA profile of Sutton Bank Jane Doe using her thigh bone, her ankle and her her teeth. And this DNA profile was tested to see if it was a match against any of the five families that came forward to police. However, it wasn't. No matches were found. But in 2013, Sutton Bank Jane Doe's DNA profile was added to the National DNA Database in the hopes that they would find a match in future and that one day we might find out the identity of this woman. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much everything that I could find on this case. What do you guys think about this case? Do you think that the anonymous caller had something to do with this woman's death, um, let me know. Um, I'm really sorry that this video was on the shorter side, I know that a lot of you guys prefer my kind of longer in-depth videos, but there really wasn't much information regarding this case online. I'm kind of nervous to post this video because every time I post like a shorter true crime video, I always get comments from people saying, oh no, please only post long ones, we prefer longer true crime videos, which I understand, but also just because a case is longer than another case doesn't mean that the shorter case shouldn't be covered. Did that even make sense? What I mean is just because some cases don't have as much information to them doesn't mean that I shouldn't talk about them because they are just as important. And I'm definitely gonna start covering more Jane and John Doe cases on my channel because I think these cases are so important to talk about and spread awareness about. Because you never know, someone watching this could be like, wait a minute, I recognize that person. I think they were a family member of mine. And it's a long shot, but it just takes the right person seeing these kind of videos and going to police. Just before I go, I want to let you guys know that I have a Twitter and an Instagram, so go and follow them if you want a kind of behind the scenes of my channel and me, I don't know. I'm normally a lot more active on Instagram, so I suggest you follow that, I'll put it on the screen, but I'm trying to be better posting on Twitter as well, so I'll leave them in the description of this video. But yeah, if you just wanna kind of keep up to date with my video schedules and what I'm doing day to day, I suggest you go and follow them. I just want to give a special shout out to the members of my Patreon. Thank you so, so much for your support, guys. If anyone else wants to become a Patreon member, I will leave the link in the description of this video. Just a little heads up, if you are thinking about becoming a Patreon, um, you can get access to all of my videos 24 hours before anyone else. Um, you get exclusive kind of behind the scenes footage. You can get access to like polls and a discussion board. It's just a lot of fun over there. So if you're thinking about joining my Patreon, like I said, the link will be in the description of this video. Please do give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and also subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys.